Thank you. The precious and strong choral anthem gave glory to God, and I believe it gave great hope and comfort to us. Thank you. Today, the title of the sermon is The Two Stone Tablets Received During the Eighth Onset of Mount Sinai and Its Redemptive Historical Administration. Since it is July, we are reading the seventh book, and it's the eternal, eternal covenant for all generations, the Ten Commandments. This Ten Commandments, it was given in the Old Testament times, but why is it an eternal covenant? Taking a look at this, we'll take a look at why these Ten Commandments are eternal covenants for all generations. And through the redemptive historical administration, we'll take a look at what God wants to tell us today. The covenant of Mount Sinai is a covenant for all generations. The covenant of Mount Sinai is a covenant for all generations, and this covenant was established with the first generation in the wilderness in the 11th point in their camp at, Ma at the wilderness of Sinai. And second, it was reconfirmed in the plains of Moab, the 41st campsite, with the second generation of the Israelites in the wilderness. 
And when this was reconfirmed, when you look at Deuteronomy 5, verse 3, Moses said that the Lord did not make this covenant with their fathers. It is certain that this was established with the first generation, but Moses said that God has established this covenant with us, with those who are alive here today. So those who had disobeyed God and died are not subjects of this covenant. So those people who came and are alive in this plain of Moab, he said that we who are here today, who are alive here today, are the subjects of this covenant. And in Deuteronomy 29, verse 15, it says, those who stand here with us today, which you mentioned before, and those who are not with us here today. And that means the future. It transcends time. And it's not just for the physical Jews, but for the people who are spiritual Jews, in, who accepted the covenant and the gospel in Jesus Christ. So the covenant of Mount Sinai is a covenant for all generations to be kept for all generations. And the subject of the covenant keeps widening and it shows us that this is a universal covenant that will be established within Jesus Christ and allows us to look forward to the new covenant and reveals the completion of the redemptive administration that will take place in the future. And that's what the covenant of Mount Sinai does. The center of the covenant of Mount Sinai is the Ten Commandments. And how are we to keep these Ten Commandments? God himself wrote the Ten Commandments, inscribed the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets. There are two times where God's fingers wrote in the history of mankind. And with this, we'll take a look at what the redemptive historical administration of God is and what He is teaching us. First, we'll take a look at Him writing in the eight ascent of Mount Sinai and wrote on the two stone tablets for the Ten Commandments. Mount Sinai is 2,291 meters. The Israelites arrived on 1446 BC on the second day of the third month and left Mount Sinai in July in the seventh month. And during this time, Moses went up Mount Sinai eight times. And during these eight ascents, God allowed the Ten Commandments to Moses over a period of three times, and that was the fourth, sixth, and eighth ascent. When we look at the fourth ascent, God gave him the Ten Commandments and the laws, and in the sixth ascent, God also gave him the Ten Commandments and the stone tablets, and in the eighth ascent, he gave the second two stone tablets. What is the main content of the Ten, ten Commandments? It is Exodus 19, verse 5. If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God commanded them to keep his commandments, and he gave the Ten Commandments over a course of three ascents. And why did he give it over three ascents and not all at once? Let's take a look at the ascents. God gave him the Ten Commandments with God's voice during the fourth ascent. That was the 50th day from the Exodus. When you look at Deuteronomy 5, verse 22, 
The Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick gloom with the great voice. When we see a fire, it's very scary, but this entire mountain was on fire. And God spoke in the midst of the fire, and He was in the cloud, in the thick gloom, with the great voice. And how would that have been if we go outside and we see that these mountains that surround us are all on fire, and God is speaking to us? Would, will we be able to stand that? The Israelites saw that, and they were swept up and surrounded with fear. Deuteronomy 5, verse 25 says, Now then, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer, then we will die. So they requested that they hear through Moses. Then why did God speak to him in his voice and tell them the Ten Commandments? The reason he told them the Ten Commandments is that they, these people who always disobey God, they are people who cannot contain God's holiness, and he wanted to show them that. He showed his greatness, and through his voice, the Israelites experienced how great God is and mighty God is. So after that, in Deuteronomy 5, verse 29, he said this, Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may, well, it may be well with them and their sons forever. God wanted them to be blessed forever, so He wanted them to have that heart and fear God. So the day when they received this was celebrated as the day of the assembly. In Deuteronomy 9 verse 10, it says, The Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written by the finger of God, and on them there were all the words which the Lord had give, spoken to you at the mountain from the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. This day of the assembly is this came from the community of faith where the Israelites received the Ten Commandments and the law. And they were a community of faith, and they formed the assembly. An assembly is where a group of people with the same mindset and the same goal go forward together. So this assembly was formed, and the Israelites they were slaves in Egypt for 430 years, for 400 years, and then it had not been even two months since they left the Exodus. They had established their own independent nation and became a holy people. And the reason for this is because God gave them this community of faith and this assembly. If they did not have this law, then the Israelites would probably have gone into chaos and without any order. That is why God spoke to them with His voice in the fourth ascent. And then He gave them the Ten Commandments again in the sixth ascent. This was the first time they received the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 24, verse 12, it says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the, ten, and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. God gave them this for the instruction so Moses can teach them. So Moses went up the mountain and in Deuteronomy 9, verse 9, it says, When I went up to the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant which the Lord had made with you, then I remained on the mountain forty days and nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. And after the forty days, in Exodus 31, verse 18, the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, and he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, the tablets of stone, and God himself wrote it down with his fingers. 
So Moses was fasting on the mountain and received this. But what were the Israelites doing on the bottom of the mountain? This is the two tablets of stone that Moses received. And the, it was the same, the front and the back. And he had two of these stone tablets. And the people below the mountain, what were they doing? In Exodus 32, verse 1, they saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, and they assembled about Aaron and said, Come, make us a God who will go before us. Aaron heard this, and he didn't stop them, but what did he do? Aaron took this from their hand and fashioned it with the graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And Aaron said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And so the Israelites they were dancing and Moses saw this and he was enraged. He was outraged and he threw those tablets and shattered them. These tablets, there is the Keresh and the Ruach. Keresh is the thick, ta thick tablet, which is about one hand breadth, 7.6 centimeters, and Ruach is a thin tablet, which is the width of one finger, 1.9 centimeters. And it says the tablets were shattered. And this is shabar, which means to shatter. And it's the PL form. So it was shattered completely, shattered into pieces. So since the Keresh, the thick tablet, would not have been able to be shattered, we see that it is ruach. And this, tablet, this stone tablet is ruach in the Hebrew text. The Israelites, on the 17th day of the fourth month, they still repent for this day and celebrate this day where the two stone tablets were shattered. In the ancient times, when the tablet of the covenant is shattered, it is a symbol that the content has been canceled. So Moses, he saw the Israelites worshiping idols. And if it were to, if they were to be judged according to the law on the tablets, they would have had to die. So to allow them to live, Moses had to shatter them, and he shattered these stone tablets by throwing them. These were these. This action was not out of a human emotional. Thing, but he, this was off of the justice of God, and it was a holy anger. All the covenants in the history of redemption, its purpose is to save the sinful people, and among that, the covenant of Mount Sinai, this was a covenant that had the problem of sin as the greatest subject in mind. And this is a covenant that shows in detail how to take care of this problem of sin. So Apostle Paul said regarding this that the covenant of Mount Sinai, its key point is that it is a revelation of what this law does in redemptive history, and that is in Romans 3, verse 20. Let's read it together. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. You can't be saved by the works of the law. So what is the purpose of the law? Those people who disobey God, they are able to understand what sin is. That is the purpose of the law. 
that is what Apostle Paul said in Romans 3, verse 20. So this law is like a prison. Those who do not live by the law, they are oppressed and they are watched. That is the purpose of the law. So in Romans 3, verse 19, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. The law makes it so that every mouth will be closed, so that they have nothing to say. That is what the law does. That is the role of the law in redemptive history. That is what Apostle Paul taught us. And in the eighth ascent, Moses received the second two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 34, verse 4, it says, Moses cut out the two stone tablets like the former ones. After the two stone tablets were shattered, Moses gave a 40-day prayer, intercessory prayer, and God said to bring the stone tablets like the former ones. So Moses cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai. And just like the sixth ascent, in verse 28, Moses was there 40 days and 40 nights, and he did not eat bread or drink water, and God wrote on the tablets of the words of the covenant. And this was the second two stone tablets. When we look at the two stone tablets that Moses received in the eighth ascent, it was just as it was written in the first stone tablets that he received. In Deuteronomy 10, verse 1, it says, At the time the Lord said to me, Cut out for yourself two tablets of stone like the former ones, and come up to me on the mountain. And what did he say? He said, Make an ark of wood for yourself. And in verse 2, I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered, and you shall put them in the ark. So God wrote what he wrote on the former tablets, on the first tablets. And what does this tell us? The Ten Commandments is the same eternal covenant from eternity to eternity that God gave to mankind. There is nothing you can add or nothing you can take away. And this also tells us that even though the two stone tablets were shattered, it doesn't mean that the content was all gone and the content did not change. It's the same for eternity. That's what this teaches us when God wrote the same words that were on the former tablets. And the Ten Commandments were to be put in the Ark of Wood. When we look in Deuteronomy 10, verse 5, there's something special about putting it in the Ark. It says, Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the Ark which I had made, and there they are, as the Lord commanded me. And here, as the Lord commanded me, is he, in Hebrew, chaba. It's the PL form or the emphasis form. And it tells us that God commanded Moses very strongly. And Moses, when he received this command, he put it in just as God commanded. And he said, there they are. And this ark of wood, what is this ark of wood? This symbolizes Jesus' humanity. Because the ark of the covenant shows us Jesus, 
This ark of wood was, was covered with gold, and it symbolizes Jesus' humanity and divinity. In Isaiah 53, verse 2, it says Jesus' humanity was like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. It was not stately or majesty that we should look, up on, look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. That was Jesus' humanity. But what was he? In Romans 1, verses 3 to 4, it says, Concerning his sons, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead according to the Spirit of Holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So this ark of wood shows us Jesus' humanity and divinity, the gold covering the shittim wood. And this ark of wood also shows us that the saints who were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ are like this wooden ark. We are worthless like the shittim wood. In 1 Corinthians 1, verses 27 through 28, it says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that He may nullify the things that are. God is speaking about ourselves, our appearance, that are despised and that are the base things. But in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 19, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with the perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So the ark of wood shows us Jesus' humanity and divinity and also symbolizes the saints who were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 he said that just like the words of God were on the tablets of stone and put in the wooden ark, we must inscribe the words of God on our hearts. And those people are workers of the new covenant and the letters of Christ. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 together. Being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. We are letters of Christ, but we were not written with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Also, in verse 6, it says, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. In Proverbs 3, verse 3, and Proverbs 7, verse 3, it says, the tablets of your heart. It uses the same word of the stone tablets, ruach to inscribe the word on the stone tablets is to inscribe the words in our hearts. So the st second stone tablets that were put in the ark of wood shows us that the new covenant will be established through Jesus Christ. It reveals the new covenant God himself wrote with his fingers two times. First was during the Eighth Ascent when Moses received the Ten Commandments. And what was the second time? It was in John 8, verses 1 through 11. Through these incidents where God himself wrote with his fingers, Reverend Abraham Park said and showed and explained the redemptive administration of the two stone tablets. 
who is Jesus Christ? Jesus is God who came in flesh. He is God and He is always with us, Emmanuel God. Before He came to this earth and was incarnated, what did He write? With His hand, He wrote the Ten Commandments. But before this man, before Jesus, the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? Jesus himself, he was the one who wrote this commandment. And according to the law, what was she supposed to, what was her judgment? Because God had written the law himself, the woman had to be stoned. God's law is saying from eternity to eternity. And in the perspective of his righteousness, not a single letter can be taken away. And that is an absolute law. So according to God's law, the woman had to die. But why did these people bring this woman to Jesus? They wanted to test him as according to John 8 verse 6. And what did Jesus do? He stooped down and wrote on the ground. And in John 8, verse 7, Jesus wrote on the ground, but they persisted in asking him. They persisted in asking him. And when you put it simply, they were questioning him. And in another translation, they said, it says that they continued to ask after Jesus wrote the first time, he did not, there was no grace of forgiveness. There was no grace of forgiveness of sins after the first time he wrote. So what was the way to save the woman? There, so the method of saving the woman was to establish a new law that can, that does not object the law that was proclaimed beforehand. So Jesus, in John 8, verse 8, he stooped down again and wrote on the ground. And when they heard this, they began to go out one by one. And Jesus was left alone with the woman. After the second time Jesus wrote, what happened? There was the blessing of forgiveness of sins. And what was the reason for this? The one who wrote on the first stone tablets and also wrote the second law that saved them he wrote the covenant, the new covenant on the ground or in the heart of mankind. The first, the law that was first given by Jesus. He established the new covenant. This was the man who established the new covenant and he recorded it on the ground and he proclaimed it on this land. So in Hebrews 10, verse 9, it says, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. He took away the first in order to establish the second. And what did he say? This is God's will. This was the way to save this woman. The woman is a representative of all the people who have an adulterous relationship with this world. 
but Jesus took away the first in order to establish the second. Just like Moses broke the first stone tablets to save the Israelites and received the second stone tablets. So Jesus gave this new covenant. And what is this new covenant? In Jeremiah 31, verse 33, it says, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is the same as the covenant of Mount Sinai. And in verse 34, it says, They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is the new covenant. And here, heart is kereb, and it means heart or the center. So it's the humanity, the personality of mankind. It, and the heart is rev, or the inner person. So God will record this inside us to make us into a new person, and He will forgive us our sins, and He will not remember those sins. Record here is katab, and it's like writing it on stone so it will not be erased forever. It's inscribing it. And this is like the Ten Commandments that were inscribed. It's the same for the New Covenant. Jesus established the New Covenant, and He recorded it, and He proclaimed it. So He saved this woman. So the second two stone tablets, the day that these tablets were put in the Ark of Wood was on the tenth day of the seventh month. And it's the Day of Atonement, where all sins are forgiven. When you record God's word in your heart, God does not remember your sins. So the second stone tablet, what does this symbolize? It symbolizes God's new covenant. So in Hebrews 10, verse 9, it says, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Then how did Jesus fulfill God's will? How did he do God's will? What was his way? What was his method? Jesus established the second by completing the first. The first two stone tablets were shattered, but the words on the stone tablets were preserved and they did not change. Jesus, when he established the second, how did he establish this? He completed the first. In Matthew 5, verse 17, it says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. In Romans 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. If so, all the sins of mankind, they had to be paid by something. And how did Jesus pay for this? Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law so that the law cannot speak. In Romans 8, verse 3, it says, For the law, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. He gave all the sins of mankind to the likeness of sinful flesh. So in verse 4, he says, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And in verse Romans 5, verse 8, Jesus died for us. 
And in Ephesians 1, verse 7, because of his blood, we were redeemed and our sins were forgiven. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid for the wages of sin with his life so that the law could not say anything. And he established the law and the covenant again. In conclusion, all the laws and scriptures hang on the Ten Commandments. In Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, It says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Commandments here is kremanimi. It means to hang or to hang from. So these two commandments, two commandments to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbors, all the laws and commandments hang from these two commandments. So these two commandments are a representative or the head of all the law. So when we take a look at the Ten Commandments, Commandments 1 to 4 are commandments regarding God, and it tells us how we can love God, how to love God. And the commandments about mankind is about how we can love our neighbors. So these two commandments, it is a compression of the commandments regarding God and the commandments regarding our relationship with man. That is why it says on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So Jesus, how did he fulfill these two commandments? He obeyed God with all his heart and giving up his life. And the greatest love for mankind. In John 15, verse 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus died for us on the cross. So he fulfilled these two commandments, loving God and loving his neighbors. And Jesus did this and completed this on the cross. He completed the Ten Commandments and fulfilled them. Jesus fulfilled the Ten Commandments on the cross. And when we look at this, that is the history of redemption for us today. This history of redemption that we are studying, it teaches us easily how to understand this gospel and this covenant. And when we just believe, then God will inscribe this new covenant in our hearts. And God gives us the second covenant of the forgiveness of sins and this new covenant of life. Jesus fulfilled the second covenant through the cross. And for us, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we become the servants of the new work and the new covenant, and we are the letters of Christ. The Ten Commandments that were written on the stone tablets, these are not laws that were only kept in the Old Testament, but this is the eternal, eternal covenant for all generations that we must fulfill. God commanded and emphasized that the two commandments were to be put in the ark of wood. And just like that, we need to put this and inscribe the word of God in our hearts. But until when? When we look in Deuteronomy 10, verse 5, on the the plains of Moab, where Moses proclaimed this word right before they entered Canaan. And for us, until the moment we enter heaven, 
the two stone tablets were to be in the ark of wood up until that moment. When do we need to preserve this? Until when? Until our lives of faith are over in this wilderness. Until the day we enter heaven, it has to be inscribed within us and it has to be preserved within us. The founding pastor said that the history of redemption is the eternal gospel as written in Revelation 14, verse 6, because these Ten Commandments are a compression of redemptive history. Let's read Revelation 14, verse 6 together. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. God gave this eternal gospel through another angel and this word of redemptive history is the eternal gospel from July 1st we are having this new goal to rebuild and protect this church we are servants of the new covenant and as letters of Christ what is the basic thing that we must do we need to inscribe the word of redemptive history in our hearts in the tablets of our hearts so that it will not fade away and we need to preserve this in the ark of wood and like that we need to preserve it in us so from July 29th we have the summer conference and after that we have the ministers conference and each department is preparing for their own summer retreat let's pray that God's amazing grace will allow his word to be inscribed in our hearts and we must have that hope and we need to attend and when we do so we will receive and all our families and nations and the people we will all be established strongly and will not waver and we must believe in this and as new workers of the covenant we need to have the fervent love of Jesus and just like we saw in the morning in the video we need to proclaim this gospel to all the world and we need to say come Lord Jesus come and we must enter the new world of heaven let's pray together Father God full of love and grace we thank you we are worthless but you have redeemed us and established us as new servants of the covenant. And we thank you. Father God, may we be able to be faithful for this new mission that you have given us. And as the consecrated people, may we proclaim your glory every day through the summer conference and through the minister's conference please allow us to be filled with the Holy Spirit through the speakers that you have prepared and through the word may we be able to be thankful and never cease to walk toward heaven please allow us for our families and our nations and please protect our families and our nations and through Pyongyangjie Church May it be a great work that is established that saves all mankind. We believe you'll listen to our prayers and pray in the holy name of Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you.